So in other words, for us, there's always a wilderness where God will allow us to be tested. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested. There's a wilderness season where God will push us and try us to see if we can be trusted with greater things. There's a seeming wasteland that's intended to refine us and increase our dependence upon him where his strength is made perfect in our weakness. This is not a season where you find out how strong you are. It's a season where you find out how loved you are. Because in those seasons, we can grit our teeth and clench our fish and try to push through. And there may be times where we have to do just a little of that. But those seasons, the best thing we can possibly do, say, God, I'm, here I am. This is, I can't do anything of my strength. You show up. The goal of every wilderness is that you would whip the enemy while you are in it. If you whip the enemy in the wilderness, how can he contend with you when you enter the promised land? Hey, we are in a new series uh, this morning called The Christmas Playlist. This will run uh, the next three consecutive Sundays, and then Jordan will finish it off on Christmas Eve uh, with the final message in this series. Uh, this is a series that is based on uh, traditional, uh, well-known, maybe some not as well-known, Christmas hymns, uh, Christmas songs. So we're going to be covering four different ones. And what we're going to be doing in this series is really exploring the sort of theological underpinnings of these, uh, some of the origins, the scriptural references, Old Testament, New Testament, that these songs are about. And in doing so, our hope is that as you sing them, uh, they have a new level of sort of power for you. They give you a new level of understanding maybe of what's behind these songs. And, and there's so many of these we sing and they're already uh, nostalgic for us or they're already somewhat powerful. But I think that when you understand even more of what the song is about, especially the scriptural aspects of the songs, that when you sing them, there's just, it lends a whole new dimension to it, a whole new level. So we're really, really excited to be able to kick off this series. Um, with that being said, I wanted to give you um, a few uh, Christmas songs uh, that we won't be preaching on, just so you know. So in case your favorite is in here, I just don't, I want you to be able to know it's not coming up, Okay. So I've got nine of these we're not going to be doing. Now, I have a couple people that are not here this morning. I was really hoping would be here because these are some serious dad jokes. So Jerry Stoner's not here today. He was in the worship team. He's a dad joke fanatic. He's not here. So he's going to have to hear this after the fact. But so let's just go through a few of these. Nine Christmas songs we will not be doing in terms of in the sermon titles that we'll not be using in conjunction with these songs. So the first one is this. Tomorrow is not promised. A sermon based on Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer, okay? If you've read any Old Testament or James, uh, James chapter 4, Tomorrow's Not Promised. So uh, it would be a good sermon title, but maybe not that song in a church. So this next one, a little more risque. I'm just going to warn you, okay? Uh, it's this next one. is Healing a Marriage After Infidelity, a sermon based on I Saw Mommy Kissing Santa Claus, I mean, you know, again, a good maybe seminar, a good book, uh, could be a powerful sermon, but probably not based on that song. Some of, some of these are, you know, there's just different ones. The next one is, you know, a good positive message. God can use you even if you're a little bit different. A sermon based on Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. Not biblical, really. Uh, the concept, absolutely. And we're going to get to that in a little bit. Now, okay, we're going to get into some serious... Serious dad jokes. This one probably I'm guessing the teenagers will have a better understanding of. So this next one is, Jesus is still undefeated. A sermon based on the first Noel. Anybody? Okay. The first Noel. That's, there's a great KB. He was a Christian rapper song. I ain't taking no L's. So that's what it's about. If you lose, you get an L. So Jesus, there's no L's for Jesus. Okay. Did I tell you these were going to be amazing? Okay, this one, I don't know. It's just a good old-fashioned, uh, washed in the blood of Jesus, a good old Southern Baptist, a sermon based on white Christmas. Not quite the same idea, I don't think. Um, again, this is going to be a serious dad joke, this next one, okay? Big time. You're going to have to use your head here. The Blessed Virgin, a sermon based on have yourself a merry little Christmas. Anybody? 
Anybody? Oh, groans. I wanted, okay. The, if you think that one was bad, you have to wait. You got a couple more. The next one, listening for and recognizing the voice of God. A sermon based on, do you hear what I hear? <laughs> okay. That redeemed the last one, okay? Good. Good to know. Good to know. Two more. This one is the most cringe grown worthy. I'm just warning you, okay? A sermon about the poverty of Jesus. Jesus was born in a poor, filthy manger. A sermon based on fleas Navidad. <laughs> Come on. That's so good. Oh. <laughs> I can't. Oh, man. All right. Last one. See. My strategy for years of preaching has either been if you're going to tell a joke, make it so good it's memorable or so bad it's memorable. Either way, people will remember. You can decide which ones these are, okay? I'll let you decide. Last, the last but not least, is this a great punching the devil in the mouth, a sermon based on deck the halls. So, all right. Okay, let's try to shift gears. So, my favorite Christmas song is the one that I get to preach on this morning, and for years and years and years, my favorite Christmas song was Oh Holy Night. Uh, but I don't know when it was, maybe a decade or, or so ago, 10, 12 years ago. Uh, it really shifted. And now my favorite Christmas song, without a doubt, is what we sang this morning, O Come Emmanuel. And we're going to have an opportunity to sing uh, that song again at the end of uh, the message, which I think is important because you will have now had all this context, uh, this background, this sort of meaning theologically and scripturally to what this song is, is really about. So let me tell you just a little bit. We'll do this each week probably a little bit about uh, O Come Emmanuel in terms of the history of it. So this hymn was originally written in Latin, which a lot of them were, but it's considered by almost everybody who knows of such things to be the very uh, oldest Christmas hymn that we have. Uh, at least the very oldest one that is still sung, that people still know to this day. This actually dates back over 1,200 years So a version of this song uh, has been sung in some way, shape, or form since the 8th or the 9th century, as best scholars can tell. It was written um, by a bunch of uh, Christian uh, monks, like in a monastery. And so they wrote this. And then we know that in the 12th century was when they actually put it to really what amounts to the current meter that we have today for it. So if you think about that, the 12th century was when we got the not exactly the you know, version we sang this morning, but the same cadence, the same rhythm, the same concepts, and stuff like that. This used to be sung, um, uh, it said seven days before Christmas Eve, so a week before Christmas Eve, monasteries would sing something called the O Antiphons. Now, I'm not going to go into all that, but the O Antiphons were this kind of series of recognizing Scripture and this progression of, uh, of waiting for Jesus' arrival. And they would sing these in anticipation of Christmas Eve, then on Christmas Eve, on Christmas Eve, they would sing the eighth antiphon, which was called O Virgin of Virgins, and it would be sung before and after the Magnificat, which is Mary's famous song in the Gospel of Luke, Luke 1, 46 through 55. If you've never read that, uh, the Magnificat, in Luke chapter 1, 46 through 55, go and read that. It's a song that Mary sings. Uh, I don't know how, how this worked spontaneously, I'm sure inspired by the Holy Spirit, but after she has come to see her cousin Elizabeth, who was also pregnant at the time with a child who would become John the Baptist, and we're told that when Elizabeth uh, hears Mary coming and senses Mary's coming, that John the Baptist, John the baby in her womb, unknown at the time as John the Baptist, but leapt in the womb like leapt with excitement, anticipation, because he knew somehow spiritually that Jesus was in (laughs) the other womb, which is a crazy thing. And they have a conversation, and Elizabeth says, the baby in my womb womb leapt, you know, that this is going to be the Lord's. There's a a divine sort of foreknowledge of this. And when that happened, Mary just gives praise to God. You've looked on favor with your humble servant. And then there's this this really powerful uh, not just like chill, but like you, you're going to bring down great nations. You're going to humble the rich and give strength to the poor. I would encourage you to read that. So this song, O Come Emmanuel, was sung in conjunction with that sort of eighth antiphon and the Mary's um, Magnificat. So these antiphons, this is the only thing I'm going to say, they were designed, this is an important note, they were designed to concentrate the mind on the coming of Christmas. They were enriching the meaning of the incarnation. 
with a complex series of references from the Old Testaments and New Testament. And that's what you see in O Come Emmanuel. It is a complex series of references from the Old Testament and the New Testament that follows in this tradition that started in the 8th or 9th century, maybe possibly a little bit before, but this song wasn't composed in any way, shape, or form until then. So with that being said, let me just read these lyrics. Again, I know we sung them, and we're going to sing them at the end, but I want you to just to listen carefully as I read these. They're not on the screen. Just listen for... uh, the references that you might catch from the Old Testament or the New Testament. O come, O come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel that mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appear. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou rod of Jesse, free, thine own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save, and give them victory over the grave. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. O come thou dayspring from on high, and cheer us by thy drawing nigh. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadows put to flight. I love that part. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. O come, thou key of David, come and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high and close the path to misery. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel, shall come to thee, O Israel. That's powerful stuff, but let's dig into it. So in the Old Testament, which makes up two-thirds of, of the Bible. If you're holding a physical Bible, and all the kids in youth group know this, because we talk about the Old Testament makes up two-thirds of it. So you have all these books, right? The Jewish scriptures, the Torah, the Old Testament, and in the entirety of all of those books about so many different topics, whether it's poetry or history or prophecy, so many different things, there really are just two In the whole book, on the whole Old Testament, there are really just two primary motifs that run all the way through the entire Old Testament. Let me define what a motif is in case you're unfamiliar with that term. A motif is a distinctive feature or a dominant idea in literary composition. A distinctive feature or dominant idea in literary composition. So in the entire Old Testament, no matter what you pick, whether you pick Psalms or Proverbs or prophecy or history or instructional things, all this stuff, if you read it from beginning to end and you kind of can zoom out a little bit and take in what's happened, you'll see basically that there are two things that emerge, two dominant themes, two dominant ideas really that are pervasive throughout. The first one I want to talk about briefly, we're not going to get into it, I just want to mention it. So this first one, and this may be a little bit hard to understand on the screen, um, but it goes like this. The first motif that you see throughout the Old Testament is this, regarding the people of Israel. They were blessed by God, then they forgot about God. In the midst of their blessing and their sort of prosperity, they would just become sort of consumed with themselves and their own pride, and they can do it on their own. They would forget about God, and they would begin to rebel and start to do all kinds of things they had been told not to do and been, you know, said, don't do this. So they would rebel. In the midst of their forgetfulness, they would rebel. Then God would send somebody, usually a prophet, to warn them and say, guys, if you don't stop rebelling and you don't remember me, you're going to get in trouble. Like, hey, I'm warning you, stop doing this. Inevitably, they wouldn't stop doing it. And so then next would come discipline. So God would say, I told you, if you didn't stop doing this stuff, this was going to happen, and now it's going to happen. So then it would happen, and they'd go, why didn't you tell us this was going to happen? Like, I did for a very long time, and you just didn't listen. So then after they had suffered for a while, they were like, oh, we didn't, you know, we can't believe we did this, and they would repent. And they would say, God, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. We will never, ever forget you again. We will never do these sins again. We will never be astray. We will always remember you. Thank you for your blessings. Could you give us those blessings back again? And then God, because he's so good and so gracious, and he loved the people of Israel, a lot of times for, he didn't make any sense, which is part of our story too. He loved them so much, he would bless them again. He would say, I accept your repentance, your contrition of your heart. 
all these things, and I will restore to you blessing. And so then they'd go back to a time of peace and a time of blessing and prosperity and all these things. And you're like, cool. And then it would all start over again. They would be blessed. Then they'd start to forget and rebel again, and then it would repeat itself. So you see this over and over and over again. Again, a dominant theme. The second one is what we're going to talk about today for the rest of our time together. And the second primary motif is what's captured in the lyrics to O Come Emmanuel, especially the first part, the first stanza. Now, I want to make it clear, okay? These lyrics to O Come Emmanuel, they are not scripture, okay? Uh, They've not been canonized. They're not part of, you know, the 66 books. But they very accurately captured the prayers and the cries of the people of Israel, So the first motif is the one we just explored. The second one is the one we're going to talk about, and that motif is this. It's a people of longing and a people in waiting slash in between slash in the middle, however you want to put that. You see throughout the Old Testament over and over again a people of longing and a people in waiting in between in the middle. The primary place you see this is the primary text for the people of Israel is the book of Exodus. In the book of Exodus, we know that they've been enslaved in Egypt for a very, very, very long time. And generation after generation has cried out to God for deliverance from this oppression, deliverance from this slavery. In the Old Testament, their lives are described as being harsh and bitter. That's how their lives were from beginning to end. And they cried out to their God to to deliver them, to rescue them, to bring blessing upon them, to free them from the hand of Pharaoh after Pharaoh after Pharaoh, right? And those prayers for a long time were not answered. But then we know that God raises up a man named Moses. And he tells Moses, you're going to go to Pharaoh and you are going to demand that he set my people free. And we know the whole thing there with Moses. And he doesn't want to, but he does anyway. But Pharaoh doesn't listen, right? Initially, we know we have all these plagues that take place. And finally, Pharaoh listens and frees the people of Israel. And they don't get that far outside of, you know, the doors, so to speak, until then Pharaoh changes his mind yet again and pursues them. And then we have the whole Red Sea crossing, and God delivers them there through the sea, destroys the armies of Pharaoh. And now they're somewhat free. But then in Exodus, we see Over and over again, again, throughout the Old Testament, we see this people of waiting in the middle, in between. Here's a truth that's not on the screen, but here's something to think about. The Israelites, once they were delivered from Egypt, they were no longer in Egypt. Okay, They weren't in the land of slavery any longer, but they weren't yet in Canaan, which was their promised land. So they were no longer in Egypt. They were no longer slaves, but they were no longer in the promised land. They had the law and the prophets would be given to them soon. They had the voice of God, right? They had all these things, but they had not yet seen their Messiah, their deliverer. So they were very much in between. They were in the wilderness. Literally, they were in the wilderness, but this wilderness is also symbolic in some ways as it was the middle It was the in-between. It was the place between Egypt and Canaan. It was their proverbial waiting room, right? It was the place, this wilderness, was a place where God cared for them and guided them day by day, right? He guided them by day through a pillar of cloud and at night by a pillar of fire. And he provided daily miracles for them of food and of water and was able to sustain them. And we're even told there's this little subtle verse that maybe you've never heard, but it says that all of their time in the wilderness, their clothes never wore out. Now, for some of you, you'd be bummed, right? Like, man, I want an excuse to get a new whatever, but it's, this is still fine. What's going on? Right? But the whole time for 40 years, their clothes didn't wear out. God sustained them day by day, miracle after miracle after miracle, and his presence was there. And he gave them not just the Ten Commandments, but another 603 as well, which is a lot of commandments. But he gave them all these commandments to live by and to direct their paths and to make sure they knew you know, how to become God's people and how to become a holy people, a nation set apart. So they had all this wonder and all these good things going on, but they weren't particularly pleased. That's a whole other story. But also, 
As they saw these daily miracles and they were daily sustained and had the visible, tangible presence of God and they had all these things going on, the wilderness for them was also a place of wandering. It was a place of wondering just exactly how long is this going to take? I'm so glad, at least they were at times, that we're no longer in Egypt. But how long is it going to take for us to get into the promised land. You see, from what I knew, and I'm talking about somebody who would have known the geography at the time, from what I understand, Canaan and Egypt aren't really that far apart. Why are we still here year after year after year, right? Biblical sort of archaeologists and geographers and things of that nature, there's different estimates on this, but I, if you had gone a straight way, just from Egypt all the way to Canaan, and you just went straight there, like there was a couple million people, we think, that were exited in the Exodus, the nation of Israel. It wasn't small, so God's providing daily for those people. But if you just walked straight from Egypt where they were at roughly to Canaan, it's, depending on who you ask, somewhere around a month and a half. They were there for 40 years. So imagine you know that, but you're like, how long is this going to take? How long is this going to be before we can finally go in? Because I understand like, you know, okay, a year and two and three, but now we're sitting at 15. And now we're sitting at 20. And like, you see this in their attitudes, right? They grumble time and time again. And at one point, they get so uh, like downtrodden and they've lost so much hope that they actually say, I wish we could go back to Egypt. And that's madness. That's madness. Their lives were harsh and bitter. They were slaves. But because the promised land has been delayed, at least in their mind, it was taking longer than it should have taken. They actually wish they could just go back and be slaves because at least there they had X, Y, and Z. And at least there they didn't have to hope against hope. At least there they didn't have any expectations, right? So here's the thing. All that, I'll tell you this, that we, just like the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, We, too, are a wilderness people. We are an in-between people. All of us in this room, if you are a Jesus follower, you are an in-between person in at least two ways. Let's talk about those. The first one is, we are a people of waiting in this life. Now, there's two parts to this part, okay? So part one, A and B, then we'll hit part two. So part one, we are a people of waiting in this life. Again, there are two parts to this. The first part, if you will, is this. Maybe you relate to this this morning. Maybe you are waiting for something to lift so you can exhale for the first time in a long time. Maybe you are waiting for something to shift so you can remember what it was like to feel light in your spirit. Maybe right now you're here this morning and there has been something on you that has been heavy, that has, metaphorically speaking, made it hard for you to breathe, and it's not just been a week or even a month. It's been longer than that, and you've prayed and prayed and prayed about this. You've prayed that you could feel lighter. You've prayed that you could exhale. You've tried every trick in the book to sort of make it happen, but it's still heavy on you. It still lingers. It still feels like it's squeezing you every day. Maybe you have moments where you're able to forget about it or drown it out or distract yourself. But as soon as you let your mind just clear and it's silent, all of this stuff comes back and it's just sitting on you, right? Maybe you are waiting. I know many of you in this room are. Maybe you are waiting for a physical healing to take place in your body. Maybe there's something that's just been an absolute burden on you and you're still waiting for a physical healing. Maybe you're waiting in some way for emotional wholeness. Maybe there's parts of you that you know are broken, right? Maybe there's something that you've experienced that's caused you great distress and you're just wondering, right, like how much longer? 
Like, how long, O oh Lord, before you come and set me free from this? How long, O oh Lord, before you break this chain that sort of bound me up? Maybe you're waiting for the pain of some great loss you've experienced to go down from a 10 to literally any number lower than that. Maybe there's a loss you've experienced, whether it was the death of a loved one, or whether it was the breakup of a marriage, whether it was the fracturing of some other really important relationship, and you thought, you know, the cliche is that time heals all wounds, but it's been a long time, and you still ain't healed. And that pain is still sitting at 10 every day. Maybe you're just waiting for that to go down, and you don't know what to do to get that to go down. Maybe you're waiting for the real restoration of a broken relationship. Maybe there's a relationship that was dear to you and it went sideways and you've prayed and prayed and prayed and you've done your part to try to get it back together. You know, you've humbled yourself. You've reached out. You've asked for forgiveness if you committed something against that person. You've tried to figure out what you might have done wrong. You've done all of that, but nothing's changed on their end. Maybe you're still waiting for that. Maybe you're waiting for the crippling burden of debt to be gone so you can have some financial stability. Maybe every day is a struggle, week to week to week, especially right now in the midst of inflation and all that we're dealing with. Maybe you're just tired, right, of having to wonder, am I gonna have enough this week to feed my family? Am I gonna have enough to buy Christmas presents? Am I gonna have enough to do this? And it's not just been a week or this year, it's been going on. Maybe you're waiting for fill in the blank. If I didn't say what it is, I'm thinking that you can probably fill in the blank. Whatever it is you're waiting for, maybe that's you. You know, as the, uh, certainly not a prophet, but maybe poet, Tom Petty uh, famously sang, and he was very accurate in this, very prophetic. The waiting is the hardest part. He said, the waiting is the hardest part. I have, for as long as I can remember, been fascinated by time. Okay? by the idea of time, by the concept of time. I'll watch all kinds of super nerdy documentaries about the time-space continuum and how things bend and how time slows down here and time doesn't slow down here. It speeds up. If you've ever seen Interstellar, you know, there's like that scene where I think it's Matt Damon gets off of the spaceship for like 15 minutes and he comes back and everybody's aged 30 years. Like I'm fascinated by that, the theory of relativity and all these types of things. But how many of you know, like, if you've ever had an intense moment where you had tension and there was an unknown and you've had to wait, don't tell me time doesn't literally slow down. Like, it does. Like, it drags, right? I mean, you've, this is a cliche, but we've all been there. What? <laughs> it's only been two minutes? When you are waiting and you're waiting for something that you long for, where you are waiting for something that you feel like you desperately need, where you're waiting for an issue to be resolved, time just drags. It just slows down. And that makes it that much harder, right? Maybe this is just me, but I've had days in my life where I just, I wake up and I'm already like, I kind of can't wait for the sun to go down so I can hit the pillow again. I kind of can't wait for this day to be over. Like you wake up waiting, ready for the day to be over, but then it just seems like it takes forever, right? And maybe this is you. And if this is you, this is you, if you're waiting in, in this sense of waiting in this life, maybe your prayer this Advent season is simply this. O come, Emmanuel. O come, thou day spring, from on high, and cheer us by thy drawing nigh. Disperse the gloomy clouds of night, and death's dark shadows put to flight. O come, Emmanuel, in your life. Jesus, show up in power. If there's these dark clouds that have been hanging over me, Drive them out, disperse these gloomy clouds of night. And if death's dark shadow, whether it's literal or figurative, is hanging over me, put it to flight, Jesus. The second aspect of being a people and waiting in this life is a little bit different. And it's this. Maybe like literally every major figure in the Old Testament you're waiting for the, for the fulfillment of something God has promised you. 
your own personal promised land. Now, before we show the next slide, I want to explain this just a little bit. What I mean by this is maybe there's something that God has spoken to you about, whether it's in your own private prayer time with him and your own listening for his voice, or whether it's through a friend or a pastor or somebody you're in a relationship with who feels like they've heard from the Lord from you and they've spoken that over you. You can call that a prophetic word or you want, or you can just call it they had a word for you. And you felt like when they spoke that over you, when you heard that it resonated deeply. It wasn't just some kind of like, oh, I just had, you know, like I just was praying, but I had all these different thoughts throughout the day, like some weird dream thing. No, this felt like it landed. It landed differently. And when it landed, you felt your heart get excited and you felt like there was a yes in your spirit, like this is what I was created to do. This is who I was created to be. And I'm not saying it's like the whole idea of, you know, in America of like that you're going to be rich and famous and all that. You don't want that mostly. And so like not that, but something different, something deep inside of you. Like these are the gifts the Holy Spirit has given me. This is how I was created to live. I want to step into that destiny, step into that purpose for my life. And maybe you know that that's true and you've heard that, but it's been a long time and it hasn't happened yet on any measurable way. Let's take a look. When I said literally every major figure in the Old Testament, I want to talk, and we're going to spend the most of our time on this, okay? So here are the major dominant figures in the Old Testament, literally every single one of them. Noah. Let's talk about this. From the time that Noah received the word from God that he was to build an ark and that his family would be spared because of his righteousness, because of his faithfulness. And he set out to build the ark between he was, when, he, when he was told and when it started raining, 55 years. 55 years. And then after it rained and the world was flooded, you know how long he was on that ark? It, we, we know there's different estimates, but it was definitely over a year. Some people say 370. Some people, it's a little bit higher in terms of days. Over a year. Some of you are like, I would have rather been flooded than been on my family, with my family on an ark for 370 days with a whole bunch of animals. Like, just take me away, Lord. Like, take me away. Right? Some of you are laughing because you know that you're not joking at all. Like, dead serious. Next. From the time that God found Abraham, which, by the way, Abraham was 75 when God came to him with this promise, that I'm going to make you the father of all nations, that the whole world will be blessed by you and your offspring. He was 75, and, you know, you'd think logically, and Abraham did, like, okay, that's amazing. I mean, I'm at the, towards the end of my life, and what a blessing. <laughs> 25 years later, before that promise was fulfilled. And Abraham at times handled it amazingly, at times not as amazingly. 25 years before the time Abraham received the word from the Lord and when it was fulfilled. My absolute favorite figure in the entire Bible besides Jesus, Joseph. Joseph was 17 and he had a couple of dreams about who he was going to be on some level. He didn't understand them fully, but he knew they were of the Lord. Now, the mistake Joseph made being a 17-year-old punk kid was he told his older brothers that he was going to be the king over them. You don't do that. You don't do that. That was silly. But between the time that Joseph heard that and the time that he stepped into his destiny to be a father, the Bible says he became a father to Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world. Joseph became a father to him, second in command. One night, he's literally in prison, Right? He goes to bed in prison. The next night, he goes to bed in the palace. Talk about whiplash. But it was 13 years. And if you know that story, none of those 13 years were pleasant. Maybe a little bit when he was in Potiphar's house. That didn't end so well. And then there was a time even in prison where he interpreted some dreams for a couple of guys in Pharaoh's court. And he said, remember me. And they were like, we will. And then they get there, and the dream interpretations were correct. And they don't remember him. And he sits there for two more years. See, sometimes we read this stuff and it's so abstract because we can't put ourselves in the story and think like, what, two more years after that? All right, next we've already talked about Moses. Moses from the time, right, that he understood who he was. He knew that he had been set apart for a reason. He had a burden for his people, right? He had a burden for the Israelites. He saw that they were oppressed and he, 
really tried to make a move on that when he was about 40. Again, it didn't go so well when he had to flee to the region, to the wilderness of Midian. Again, a wilderness. There's a whole lot of similarity in some of these things, but he went to the wilderness. He knew that he was going to be helping his people. At 40, he goes to the wilderness. It wasn't until he was 80 that God shows up in the burning bush. 40 years he was a sheep herder. 40 years he lived in a complete and a total obscurity, being married, raising some kids, helping with his father-in-law's flocks. 40 years. And last is King David. When David is anointed, a lot of people do not know this, but when David was anointed by the prophet Samuel, he was a teenager-ish. We don't know. But we do know from the timeline that between the time he was anointed king of Israel and the time he actually became the king of Israel in any significant way, 15 to 20 years. 15 to 20 years. And if you read his story, there were some good times and there were some really, really not good times. Like I said, maybe you relate to this like every central figure in the Old Testament. You were waiting for the fulfillment of something God's promised you. And you haven't seen it, and you're like, Lord, how much longer? I love what the pastor Chris Vallotton says about this. He says, in between the promise and the palace is the process. In between the promise and the palace is the process. Whether you take that from David or from Joseph in terms of reigning specifically in kingdoms, when you receive that word, And then when that word is fulfilled, there's a lot of work that's got to be done. There's a lot of work that's got to be done. In other words, let me back up one second. You see this, right, as a primary reason why God, we're told, led the people of Israel not on the most direct path, but made them wander around. Why, we're told? Because he had to prepare a people for himself. They still had so much of Egypt. They still had such a slavery mindset inside of them. He knew they wouldn't be able to inherit the promised land in their current state. He had to get all of the Egypt out of them before they could inherit the promised land. And he does the same thing with these figures in the Old Testament. And he does the same thing with us. Joseph was this kind of arrogant, brash 17-year-old, and God had a plan for him, but God knew it's going to take some time, and it's going to take a bit of suffering, and it's going to take a bit of hardship to really refine him and mold him so that when he comes to the throne, when he becomes a father to Pharaoh, that he will be the kind of person who, even though his brother's treated him terribly, sold him into slavery, left him for dead, even though they did that. But when he comes into power, he will have so much humility and brokenness in the best way that when they come to him, he won't be angry and seek revenge and seek to sort of, you know, do to them what they did to him, some sort of vengeance. He will weep over them and be thankful that he gets to see them again. Think about what kind of a work of heart that is and how long that would take How many of you have you ever prayed prayers, right? And then you've looked back five, ten years after the fact, and you're like, man, thankfully that was not answered. And it's not the Garth Brooks, I thank God for unanswered prayers, although that's maybe true, but like it's this idea, and I have this in my own life where I feel like there's things God has talked to me about, you know, for Carrie and I in our future, and it's like, God, and I thought this was gonna happen a long time ago, and I'm like, I'm really glad it didn't. Because I wouldn't have been able to hold it. I wasn't the kind of person that could enter that promised land, not in the ways that God needs me to be. So in other words, for us, there's always a wilderness where God will allow us to be tested. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested. This is on the screen for you. There's an ordained wilderness that God will use to get the old slavery mindset out of us so he can prepare us for greater things. This isn't necessarily popular theology. Yeah, God might let you have to grind it out for a while. We don't believe here that God sends sickness or illness or those types of things, but this is a vastly different thing I'm talking about here. There's a wilderness season where God will push us and try us to see if we can be trusted 
with greater things. You know what made Moses such an incredible man? Is that God comes to Moses and God says, Moses, these people are complaining, they're grumbling, they're not thankful, they're just ridiculous. I rescued them, I've delivered them, I've provided, and they're just, I'm, gonna, I'm killing them. I'm killing them. This is actually an exchange that happened. I'm killing them. And Moses goes, God, don't do it. Moses was the one that had to deal with these people all the time. They frustrated him too. But Moses' heart was such that when God says, like Moses, I'm going to kill him, Moses is like, don't do it. What kind of a man is that? It's a man who's gone through a wilderness season. Somebody who's been refined, who's been purified, who's been tested and tried, and they've been found to be faithful. That's the reason God would give this responsibility, if you will, to Moses, because Moses could be trusted with it. Abraham did the same thing with Sodom and Gomorrah. God, if, I can just, if you can just find a few righteous people, spare it. The heart that that person has, Joseph's heart, right? David's heart to not kill Saul when he could have. Do you see a theme here? There's a seeming wasteland that's intended to refine us and increase our dependence upon him, where his strength is made perfect in our weakness. My friends told me a long time ago when I was going through a season like this, this is a key. If you just take one thing away from today, if you're in a season like this, this is an absolute key statement. He told me, hey, Josh, this is not a season where you find out how strong you are. It's a season where you find out how loved you are. Because in those seasons, we can grit our teeth and clench our fish and try to push through, and there may be times where we have to do just a little of that. But those seasons, the best thing we can possibly do is say, God, I'm, here I am. This is, I can't do anything in my strength. You show up. Getting close to finishing here. The goal of every wilderness is that you would whip the enemy while you are in it. If you whip the enemy in the wilderness, how can he contend with you when you enter the promised land? It's like we talked about last week with, you know, one of my heroes, Rich Mullins. When you have somebody who doesn't fear anybody but God and doesn't want anything from this world, that's a dangerous person. If while you're in the wilderness, you still lean heavy in God, you don't start to question your faith or doubt things just because things aren't going your way, but you press in and for deeper levels of intimacy with him and you lean on the truth of scripture rather than your feelings and you still serve and you still give and you still maintain faithfulness. And when you're in a bad season, oh my gosh, look out. Because when you come out of that, just like Jesus, Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. We have this for a slide too. Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit, and he departed the wilderness, what? In the power of the Spirit. That's the prayer that when you're in these, I have prayed in my own life when I'm in wilderness seasons, and they've been hard, and I don't like them. This does not make me a superhero by any stretch, but I've prayed, God, I do not like this. <laughs> I do not like this. But do not end this season in my life till I've gotten everything out of it I could possibly get. And don't let me miss anything. Part of that's because I don't want to go through it again. So I'm like, I'm here, this stinks, but I want to extract every bit. I want to squeeze every little bit of Holy Spirit mojo juice, whatever I can, out of this. Because when I come out of this, I want to be different. I don't want to be the same. The challenge for us, of the, for those of us who are in this season, and I already said it, can God trust us while he's away? You know, there was a, a really brief time when Moses went up on the mount to, re, to meet with God, and he wasn't up there for 15 minutes, and the Israelites were like, we don't have a God, and they made a golden calf. When it seems like God is absent in your life, will you still worship him? But he's not absent. Can he? God trusts us while he's away. I want you to understand and be clear that I'm not saying God's ever away. He's not. This is the way we feel sometimes. Can we worship, devote ourselves to prayer and fasting, to reading the word, to caring for the orphan and the widow, to taking up our cross, what we talked about last week, when we may not have caught sight of land yet, when we're out adrift on the open sea and we just don't even know, we don't have our bearings on some level, can we lock in and still do these things? Can we find contentment in the in-between? Can we trust in the promises for our lives even when we seem to be stuck in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water? If this is you, let me encourage you to embrace the process. Embrace the middle. You may feel right now that all you're doing is sowing weakness, but if you remain faithful, you will reap strength. Not a strength of your own. 
be clear on that, but a strength of the Holy Spirit. Before any resurrection, there has to be a crucifixion. If this is you, maybe your prayer this Advent season is simply, O come, Emmanuel. O come, thou rod of Jesse, free. Thine own from Satan's tyranny. From depths of hell thy people save and give them victory over the grave, meaning you're experiencing some kind of a death in your life, even if it's a death to self that's a necessary one. Whatever it is, God, this season, this grave season that I'm in, give me victory over it. You've led me in, lead me out in power. Let me go ahead and invite the worship team to come up here as we prepare to close. The last way that we're in waiting is this. And I skipped a couple slides, guys. We are a people of waiting for the next life. We are a people of waiting for the next life. This is much, 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 much of what Advent is about. A lot of times people will think that Advent is to remember his first coming, and it's actually not. That's not the primary function of it. It's not a bad one at all but it's just not what it was intended for. The primary function of Advent is to look forward to, to speed, to pray for his second coming. Because here's the truth of this waiting season that we're in through the victory of Jesus, through what we celebrate each week through communion. We're no longer slaves to the fear of death and our salvation, as the scriptures tell us, is nearer now than when we first believed. That's true all the time. But we are not yet in our promised land, which make no mistake about it, is not on this earth. It's in our heavenly home. We're in exile. We are in many ways, and you probably see this more and more with each passing day, we are in many ways in Babylon. We are in, a, we are in a sort of captivity on some level and we long for deliverance. Hebrews 11 is like the hall of fame of faith. I'm not gonna go through all of it, but it talks about all these different great figures, historical figures, the nation of Israel that were faithful to the God. And it talks about all they went through. They went about in sheep skins and goat skins, which is really bad clothing back then. And they were destitute and they were hungry and they were naked and they were oppressed and says they were sawed in half. Their bodies were given to the flames, all these different things. And it says they didn't waver. And why didn't they waver? It says they, if they had been looking for a country of their own, they would have given up, but they weren't looking for a country of their own. They were looking for a better place another country, a heavenly home. They had their eyes focused on eternity. They knew that they were just passing through. They were able to understand that this life is not all there is. And while we're waiting for fulfillment and healing in different areas of this life, we're all gonna die with something not fixed. Otherwise we wouldn't die. Something is going to take you out. If you're healed 99 times, there will be a time when you're not and you pass away. And that's okay. Because we're waiting for this next life. He has come once, Emmanuel, God with us. John 1. The beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. That has happened, but Advent is about longing for his second coming. So our collective prayer, no matter where you're at today, no matter whether you're related to this message or not at all, if you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Jesus, in this season, our collective prayer is, O come, Emmanuel. O come, thou key of David, come, and open wide our heavenly home. Make safe the way that leads on high and close the path to misery. Prepare the way for his coming this Advent season.